The 2020 election is coming up quickly, and throughout the campaigns, Democratic candidates have been making big claims about the kind of change that they can achieve in office. On the table is free tuition, Medicare for all, even universal basic income. So my question becomes whether these politicians can keep their promises if they're actually elected into office. I say no, and I blame the filibuster. Now the filibuster is a complicated issue, so first I'm going to give some background and history on the filibuster, and then I'll introduce arguments for and against. First, an explanation. For a bill to pass in the Senate, it needs a vote of a simple majority. Or for a House of 100 people, this means 51 votes. But most of the time, our Senate never actually has that vote. Instead, they vote on whether or not to vote. This vote is called cloture, and it requires 60 Senate votes. And as a result, 41 senators can hold up a bill in the Senate indefinitely. Think about it this way. Say you're running for class president, and you need 51% of the class's support to be elected. But before you can actually be elected, 66% of the class needs to vote to have the election in the first place. So in theory, even if 51% of the class wants you as class president, you really need 66% of the class's support to make that happen. The Senate didn't always run like this, so let's rewind. In the early years of American government, Senate debate would automatically elapse after a certain period of time. And then in 1805, Aaron Burr, our favorite villain here at Hamilton College, <laughs> decided that the Senate was just too prestigious of a place to be held to these strict time constraints, and that senators should be able to debate for as long as they wanted. And so with a vote of a two-thirds majority, the Senate did away with the time constraints. But because the Senate was so small at the time, it wasn't much of an issue because they could only talk for so long before they would tire out. Now, fast forward to the 1960s. Now you have a Senate of 100 people. And the Senate majority is trying to pass popular civil rights legislation, which the Republican minority really didn't like. And it was then that the Republicans rediscovered their ability to filibuster. They started giving speeches that would last for hours, and when they ran out of things to say, they would give detailed explanations on how to cook southern dishes. <laughs> and one senator even read aloud from a local phone book. Seems like a good use of taxpayer dollars, right? <laughs> well, eventually, these senators tired out after around 60 days of this long debate. But the other senators were frustrated by how much time had been lost. So with another vote of a two-thirds majority, the Senate changed its rules. And to filibuster, you no longer had to get up and actually give these long speeches. You only needed to threaten to. This is what the cloture vote is. And now, 41 senators can vote against ending debate, a bill is tabled, and the Senate moves on. And it becomes far, far easier to filibuster. Again, it wasn't much of an issue at the time, and the filibuster was rarely used until around the 2000s when something changed. And Senate, senators realized that they could gain more politically by fighting than by compromising. And then the Senate minority started to filibuster every bill that came across the Senate floor. And at this point, there's almost no bill that can make it to the Senate without being instantly shut down. And I believe that the filibuster affects more than just the Senate, it impacts every aspect of American government. Because the people that actually take time to read the legislation, they're not your average Americans. These are activists. They're people that donate to campaigns, they're Bernie bros, they're Hamilton students. They're not moderates. And politicians know this, and they can play to it. In the same way that Fox News doesn't bother to make content that all enjoy, politicians don't make legislation for people that don't pay attention to politics. They only play to their most radical voters. And this means that bills get more and more extreme and often unrealistic because senators know that there's no chance of their bill passing in the first place. It opens the door for symbolic politics and it ruins all hope that we can ever compromise or close our political divide. Now you may say that the only bills we should be passing should be those that have broad bipartisan support, and therefore getting 60 votes doesn't seem all that hard. But think about it this way. 41 senators can hold up a vote, which means 21 states. If you look at the 21 least populous US states, their total population is equal to only 11% of the total U.S. population. Meaning, in theory, 11% of the U.S. population can hold up a vote that is wanted by the other 89%. Now, granted, this hypothetical is unlikely, but the issue doesn't go away when we consider modern political parties. 
If you look at only states that have two Republican senators, and then you look at the 21 least populous of those states, they only represent 25% of the total US population. Now the most common argument for keeping the filibuster is that without it, bills will be passed too quickly and not much care will go into them. Well, the flip side of that argument is that if you slow down our government so much that it can't pass any legislation, then the power of that government goes away. It's inefficient and it can't provide for the needs of its people. Our founders were worried about this. Alexander Hamilton wrote on the subject, he said, vigor of government is essential to the security of liberty. Now I think he was worried about another revolution, which might have been a little bit extreme, but his point still stands. Slowing down our government to be thoughtful is one thing, but binding its hands so tightly that it can't function is another. By doing away with the handcuffs of the filibuster, yes, legislation will be passed more quickly, and perhaps legislation that I don't always want to pass. But politics is a pendulum. And if we vote out our senators because we disagree with a bill that they passed, that's far more powerful than keeping them in based on their false promises. Another common argument for keeping the filibuster is that everybody wants to get rid of the filibuster when they hold the Senate majority, but you're glad you have it once you're in the Senate minority. And while this may be true historically, things don't need to stay this way. We have the power to demand that our senators make abolishing the filibuster a top priority. Because what our government currently enables is a stubborn minority holding hostage the will of a nation. To leave you with another Alexander Hamilton quote, when a minority controls the will of a majority, a government must always savor of weakness and sometimes border upon anarchy. If our government doesn't reflect the will of its people, then what is the meaning of our democracy? Thank you. Thank you.